Good afternoon, microhammers. This is uh, Brian, K7UDR. And today I'm going to talk about the Ultimate Packet Workstation. Um, when I came up with that name, I thought that's what I was really building. But the more I look at it, it's not really the Ultimate Packet Workstation because we'll never have that. It's not even the penultimate packet workstation. I think it's more like Zeno's paradox, where you take a step and you're halfway there, and then you're halfway there, but you never quite get there. The first half of this presentation is going to build the infrastructure that we've worked on over the years, and then we're going to move forward into what we can do with it. This is my first time doing this format. I usually have more of an interactive session. So I expect a lot of questions and feel free to challenge any of these ideas and add your own things to it. So let's get started. What do you want to be when you grow up? At least when you grow up in packet radio. Well, there's APRS. You could be Digis and iGates and things like that. RMS gateways, RMS clients, lots of fun stuff there. BBSs. BBSs are still relevant, and I'll talk more about that towards the end, about why there are some cases where a BBS is preferred to other methodologies. In this year of 2021, we're still predominantly 1,200 baud. We've been doing some 9,600 baud stuff here in, on San Juan Island, and it's, uh, it's really stunning to look at the difference. And I want to do it all. Don't you? But there's a problem. We can do all of the client side stuff, you know, one at a time, but all the host things require dedicated radios and antennas and filtering to allow multiple operations. Well, that's all fine for a repeater site but that doesn't really work for a home operating station. Let's go back in time. Back in 2012, I did a pitch down at DCC in Atlanta called a hailing channel for packet radio. And I started with the channel paradox. We were looking at our local systems and we were trying to pick what fixed frequency to operate our digis and our BBS on and our gateways. And so you have to choose a station channel. But the paradox is I want to be on the most popular frequency so I can connect to everyone else. But then when I have traffic, I don't want anyone else to be on my frequency. So what we need is a hailing channel. Designate a channel for hailing only. Move your traffic to a different frequency. Well, that's actually pretty obvious. We've been doing it for a long time manually. HF nets typically go down five and handle your traffic. For you boaters out there, um, what's the best way to get a radio check? Go on channel 16 and ask for a radio check. And I guarantee that three boaters will come back to you and say, there's no radio checks on channel 16, at which point you say, thank you. We could automate it. That's all trunk radio is. You have a single frequency everyone's on, and then automatically you're handed an operating frequency by the controller. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not aware of any amateur apps that are using a trunks methodology. So all I have to do is agree on a frequency. Now it's time for a story. When I did this pitch in Atlanta, I'd never met Bob Bruninga, but I was aware of the fact that Bob, as the father of APRS, was still very, very active on what it is and how it's used. And so I wanted to use the APRS frequency, but I wasn't sure that he would go for it. 
and I ran the risk of having this whole thing kind of fall apart. So I stood up there and said to the crowd, what frequency should we use? And a gentleman in the back said, 14439. And I said, thank you, sir, what's your name? And he said, I'm Bob. Use the APRS frequency, that's what it's there for. That's what he said. So with a sigh of relief, I knew that that was okay and I could move forward with this. So we have an APRS control channel. We're going to use rig control to achieve automated frequency agility. And I noted that voice alert really already does this. So you monitor the APRS frequency and then when you come near somebody you pick it up and then you can do rig control through the radio, certain Kenwood radios. I think some of the ACEs do it too. And then you can go ahead and talk to people. The next thing that we're going to come up with is to use authenticated messaging to control your station remotely. Say that again. Another presentation I gave back at Microhams in 2012 was the case for adding authentication to amateur radio. At this point, I got another Bob story. So by this time, I'd met Bob, and he's a great guy to work with. So I was talking to my software guy, Basil, about, I think we need to do authenticated packets. And Basil said, being a longtime Linux programmer, I'm sure somebody's already done that. So I emailed Bob and said, has anyone done anything about authentication for APRS? And he said, no, but if you do it, please publish it so we all do it the same way. Let's take a look at how we do remote control today for our repeater sites. Pick a weird frequency on a different band, add a tone to it, use DTMF control, use over-the-air access code, and hope no one's listening. There's a few problems with that. But for a Peter site, it's okay. It works fine. We've all done it for a long, long time. We're still doing it. But if we're going to use APRS, we have a different issue. And that issue is everything shows up recorded on APRS.fi via the APRS-IS network. So everything is in plain sight for everyone to look at. Uh, by the way, thanks to HESU and others who put this whole system together. So instead, we're going to use DTMK control which stands for don't touch my knob. The idea behind this is I have a remote site and I would like to control it over the air with APRS, but I want to restrict the control to a certain group. So the radio authenticates commands sent as plain text messages and they're time encoded to prevent a replay attack, which is where Someone sees what you do, QSY, blah, 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 and then you play it back later. But because of the time coding, that won't work, much like a one-time password. For an example, it's the command K7UDR, QSY to a new frequency, and then you append the digest to the end. Implementation. Time for an Andrew story. So a couple years later, I'm at Hamvention, and I'm at the APRS seminar, which Bob um, has a bunch of different people in APRS come up and talk to things. So I'm sitting there in the front row, and Andrew Pavlin comes up, and he tells this story. He says, I love APRS, but I have this motor home, and I'd like to start the generator occasionally but I don't want anybody else to start the generator. 
And Andrew continues that he ran across my Microhams presentations from a couple of years prior and implemented it and then said, and if I knew who Brian Hoyer was, I'd ask him for his permission, blessing, whatever. And I said, well, you're lucky because I'm sitting in the front row. Andrew continued. He said, well, I didn't do it the way you described in your paper. And I said, well, did you use standard authentication tools? He said, yes. I said, then whatever you did is better than whatever I wrote about. So Andrew implemented it in YAC in 2014. Thank you, Andrew Pavlin, KA2DDO. Does use standard authentication? It's currently being updated because I believe the MD5 function is being deprecated. How do we deploy this? So a clever group shares a single key via secure meeting, you know, like a club meeting or any way you want to do it. And then group members can use Yak to send authenticated messages. When I was doing this a few years ago, there was more confusion about authentication versus encryption, but authentication is not encryption. Everyone can read all the messages. However, group members have the keys and they can authenticate the received messages as well. This is the mechanism we're going to use for remote control so that our systems don't get mangled by people who inadvertently or intentionally mess with your station. Let's talk about how to automate your station. First off, hardware requirements. We need a computer with a USB or serial port. We need a rig control cable, a radio interface, and a radio with rig control capability. Here's what my test station looks like. I've got a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus with a DRAWS hat. DRAWS stands for Digital Radio Amateur Workstation. It's been out for a couple years. We use the Kenwood TMD71A dual bander specifically because it has good rig control features and is a good radio as well. Connected by a USB rig control cable. We also have an Alinko DR235-220 radio. It does not have rig control. But because the Draws hat has two radio ports, we can also do um, voice or digital over that separately from the dual banner Kenwood. And I picked up an ICOM 7300 HF rig, specifically because as a newer rig, it has both rig control and sound capabilities via USB. So off a single draws hat, I can control three radios. I want to mention that nothing is specific to the draws hat that we're going to talk about. And all of our software is written in Linux and is open source. Here's what a draws hat looks like. Basically, you can see on the left hand side, you can see the connectors and then the mini dins across the bottom. There's a GPS in the corner and on the right is the battery to keep uh, the GPS up. What's on there? 9 to 15 volt station power, which back powers the Pi, so you don't need a 5 volt adapter. It has two mini DIN 6 radio interfaces. It has a GPS with pulse per second and we also include an SMA LNA antenna there's a battery backup for warm start. If you haven't worked with GPS much, you'll know that a cold start can take quite a long time. But if you start from where you last were and memorize that, it comes up much quicker. And the PPS allows us to be a stratum one time source. Now, stratum one means I'm one hop from the GPS system itself. If you look at your basic network NTP, you'll find that you're typically, oh, half a dozen to a dozen hops away from the actual source. 
Now, a lot of the new HF stuff needs accurate time, and I'll be perfectly honest with you, you don't need a stratum one time source because it's far more accurate than is necessary given HF propagation. But we think it's cool. And then we added an eight pin accessory connector so unused IOs can be accessed. Here's a picture of the case. If you've been following us, you know that the case took too long and the prototypes cost too much. And I went through five different MEs to get here, but we do have it now. And more importantly, we have a vendor relationship to do more cases in the future because a computer without a case is kind of a longing. Here's the top of the case. We decided to get fancy and do a little advertising on it. I don't do a lot of Morse code, so someone stop me if the Morse on here doesn't say NWDR. So, I have a Winlink home station. I've got a setup with Pi. I've got a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse. I can also get into it remotely. I can use it as a, as a headless computer. And what are the th kinds of things I want to do with it? Well, for our income stuff, we have to answer the question, what arm as gateways can I hit? Now, currently, what we used to do is you go pull a list or a map from Winlink and you look at it and then you poke them all. You twist the knob, you push the button, you log the results, lather, rinse, repeat. And it takes a while. Here's a map of San Juan County. Um, I know with these network things, we're now getting a much broader audience to microhams than just the folks in Western Washington. So I'll tell you where we are. In the center of the map is San Juan County, which is composed of all of the islands in San Juan, of which there's like a hundred and something of them, of which like 20 of them have power and about that number are actually inhabited. But it's sitting right in the middle of Puget Sound so it's in between Victoria to the left, Bellingham to the right. It's a little north of Whidbey Island and a little south of Vancouver. So here's a map I get from Winlink that shows all the packet stations that are in my region. I do want to note that if you look here in the center, you'll find that the highest density of RMS gateways is on Lopez Island. And there's a reason for that. Um, Right in the middle is Basel N7NIX. But when you're writing software, it's really good to have a test farm. So some of our other Lopez hams have put them up RMS gateways as well. Now, when it comes to gateways, I like to use the bug zapper analogy. So bug zappers have two functions. They attract bugs and then they kill them. So what you really want in a bug zapper is to buy the biggest, meanest bug zapper you can and then give it to your neighbor so all the bugs go over to his place and then they die there. So when we put up gateways, I've had hams tell me that, well, you know, our gateway's down. What are we going to do? It's like, well, you have to remember that our gateway isn't for us because the gateway only works when the internet's up. And if the internet's up, then we don't need the gateway. Gateways are always for somebody else. Okay, new stuff. Basil's written a script called Auto RMS Gateway Find that basically automates the function of who can I hit. It runs every six hours. Why six hours? Well, in the early stages, we wanted to get a lot of data. And with six hour periods, which happens to be the same frequency as a National Weather Service forecast, we can actually see diurnal effects. We can actually see some stations that come up at night that don't come up during the day and vice versa. The first thing the script does, over the internet, there's a function that Winlink provides that allows you to query it and determine how many gateways and what gateways are within a given distance 
of your grid square. Once we have that information, using our rig control, we QSY to each gateway frequency, and then we attempt a connection. After that, the system logs all the results. This has been operating for over a year by N7IX in the middle of Lopez, and we now have a, enough data to go look at it and say, what do we practically need to do to deploy this in our county? So there's a function he's built that does an aggregation I'm going to show you a weekly aggregation, which I think is about the right time frame, but you can also do monthly and yearly aggregations. So here's a log. Um, this is probably going to be a little hard to read. Don't worry about it. It's going, to, it's going to blow up in a second. But here's all the stations. There's 30 some odd stations that are within 35 miles of CN88N. And first off, let's take a quick look at the frequencies. You'll notice that the bulk are on two meters. And some of the channels, as I talked about earlier, are more popular than others. Like 145, 630 shows up a lot. 145.05, I see a couple of slots. But there's a spread there, and that's a good piece of information for deciding if you want to have a lonely frequency for some private communications where that might be. System also logs actual distance to station. That's kind of interesting because given terrain, distance is not an accurate indicator of performance. On this particular list, we only have one 9600 baud station. Um, that's going to improve over time. And then because it's a weekly aggregate, we look at the number of connections so six hours, four times a day, seven days a week. There's 28 attempts in a week. And you'll note that a couple of stations were 100%, and then they fall off to there. If you go down the list, you'll find a station that hit 43%. Stations which run around 50% are often those diurnal stations that I talked about earlier. Having knowledge of that might make those good choices depending on your time of day and your need. And then we've got 18%, we've got five hits. I do have to note that sometimes you don't get a hit because the station's down. And in fact, once basil has been doing this, one of the station operators contacted him and said, can you send me an email when my station's down? And so he's, he's doing that for him. There's also a blacklist function. There's no point in pounding on stations that you know you can hit none of the time. And also, some of the stations aren't really important. Like up here, there's a big list of the stations we can hit. So although AF 4 p.m. is 100%, he's four miles away on Lopez Island. He's on the same internet as Basil. So if Basil's down, he's down. That's not a useful station for communication. Down here is your own station. And of course, you'll never hit that. So that's a throw out. Then you can add to the blacklist any stations down here that over time you find you just never hit them. So there's no point in poking it. How do we use this information? Well, because we're automating things, instead of spinning the knob and hitting the button to connect to an individual gateway, we tell the system to connect to gateways from our log list, which proceeds from most likely until success. A future enhancement could easily be, let's do a failover to HF. That's part of why I have that 7300 on my system. I think this is awesome. So where'd you get one and let's all do this? Well, 
I'm not sure that's a great idea. I don't think we all need to do this. For example, um, one of my closest neighbors is about 100 feet from my station. Uh, both of us doing that doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, it's a lot of gear for the average ham. What if we could just share the list? So what's the best way to share the results of this with my neighbor hams so we can all take advantage of it? So we're building the San Juan County Monitor. We've chosen six geographically dispersed locations and we'll assign each one a six hour time slot so that we're not all trying to beat everybody up at the same time. A typical run is less than 15 minutes. That's a full run. And I want to point out that because not all the stations are on the same frequency, you're not really clogging the channel all that much. Then the aggregated results are posted on our BBS weekly to make it available to all of our local hams. This is an alpha right now and it's moving to beta shortly. So here's our county map and first off you need to look at the terrain because we have some significant mountains and hills and valleys in the island and consequently like stations need to be looked at from different spots. The view from East Sound up in the north of Orcas is very strong into the Vancouver area and they have a lot of high stations we can hit. The west side, that's over here, Orcas is up here. The west side has some steep mountains on this side. This is Mount Dallas at a thousand feet, the tallest mountain in San Juan Island. And it looks very strongly at Victoria, but has a very little view to the east. I'm up here at Roche Harbor. This is Cape San Juan. It's got a totally different view. Here's Basil over in the center of Lopez Island. And one of the Microhams folks, Kenny, has uh, some property on Lopez and he's right over here and he gets a little different view as well. So between those six stations, we this red mark is our BBS, which is sitting up on Vuzario. Um, this is Mount Constitution, the highest point in the San Juan Islands at 2,700 feet. And this spot is just down the mountains. And as you can see, looking to the west, all of the stations can hit it easily. It doesn't have much of a view to the east because it's in the shadow of the mountains. Let's move on to transient operations. What do I mean by that? Well, I started this whole thing with what I want to do. I want to do everything. So what we've done is we've decided I'm going to take one side of my Kenwood and park it on APRS and let it operate continuously as an eye gate and a digi. On the other side of that same radio, it's set to 440 and I use that for local voice communications. I also have a 220 radio, which I can use manually for either voice or digital communications in our county. So it's on APRS 24 seven, unless I want to do something else. Something else might be connect to a bulletin board. Something else might be turn in, become an RMS gateway. Um, once again, remember the gateways are for other people, not myself. So I might use it for RMS client, but I could also use it as a gateway. Now, if I'm here, I can punch the button and turn it into a gateway. But if it's going to be useful to people outside the county, I need to grant them permission to flip my station into a gateway if they need it. We also are in good shape here on San Juan Island. Um, I have a gigabit fiber to that station and that goes all the way back to, it goes straight to uh, the Western in Seattle. Um, we have a lot of bandwidth in the island, which is in a submarine cable on glass. So although it can go down and when it goes down, it goes down all over. Um, it's pretty strong and pretty powerful. 
another thing we could do is if we took that mountaintop digi we have, which is on a KPC three plus fixed frequency, if we switch it over to one of these systems, then we could QSY the digi. Why would I want to do that? Well, if we've lost internet and we have that list of stations we can hit and we find that the stations, we can only hit them through digi, but our digi is not on that frequency it, that goes back to the most stations list or least stations list. And I have a good reason to be either one of those. We could QSY the Digi using APRS commands. Now, of course, you always want a timer frequency fallback for all remote operations. So we never lose remote access. And in closing, I'd like a shout out to, uh, to Bob Reninga, WB4APR, who has done so much for amateur radio. He is truly the grand poobah of APRS. Also, Andrew Pavlin, KA2DDO, the individual that took an idea I had and implemented it nicely to give us more access to it. And finally, Basil Gunn, N7NIX, who's our draw software developer, who's put all this together for us. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. K7UDR, out.